2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14. Verse 14. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we recognize that you have given to us scriptures, holy, sacred writings that have come down from you, sometimes directly being written on stone, sometimes through intermediate means, through the agency of men that you moved But we recognize that the book you have given us, the writings you have given to us, are sacred and they are inspired by you. We ask that that thought would permeate our own way of thinking as we come to your word. And we pray that you would guide our time in it this morning, that we might be blessed in our knowledge of what you have said. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. You may be seated. We will not be back in 2 Timothy, but I thought that was an appropriate place for us to begin. We have been going through selected psalms now for several months, and I thought that when Jeremy was out of the office and out of the pulpit, it would be a good idea to do something that he might not have the liberty to do on a week-by-week basis. And so what I want to do this morning is look at several special issues that are peculiar to the Psalms. This is what we would normally cover in an introduction. When you start studying a book, it's standard for you to do introductory studies, answer questions like, who wrote this book? When did they write this book? Why did they write the book? Who did they send the book to? And you normally do that study before you begin looking at verse 1. Well, in the book of Psalms, it's no different. Well, it is a bit different, as we'll see. But it's no different, and those questions are important. And so what I want to do this morning is answer a few of those questions and a, a few other special issues that are peculiar to the book of Psalms. I want to begin by looking at the history of the Psalms, which you may never have considered. I think many of you probably have, but it's entirely possible that you've never considered this before. How did the book of Psalms come to be? If I asked you to tell me the history of the writing of the book of Luke, I would hope after several years in the book of Luke, something would come to your mind, perhaps the first four verses where Luke tells Theophilus, it seemed like a good idea to me. Now that I've taken a careful account and done research, it seemed like a good idea for me to write some of this down for you. And so we have an idea of how Luke came to write this book. Or if I asked you to tell me the history of the book of Numbers or the book of Romans, you could tell me something briefly, probably about the history behind how the book was written. Some books are written by a single author, most in fact. Some were written by or in a single sitting. We're quite confident that several of Paul's epistles, if not all of Paul's epistles, were written in a single setting. He sat down, wrote the whole thing, and was done. It took him just a matter of minutes or hours. Some books are gathered materials. Sources are gathered together. The book of Genesis probably contains some of that. Moses wasn't around, as it turns out, back in Genesis 1. 
He wasn't there when God created the heavens and the earth. He was not there when Adam, was, uh, when Adam died or when Adam gave birth to his firstborn son, yet he had a record of it. It might have been an oral record so that they continued uh, by, by memory speaking the, the accounts. But somehow Moses, a thousand or so years after those events, probably much more, but at least, he was able to write all of this down in a book we now call Genesis. Other books are written by divine oracles or some given straight out of the mouth of God. The Ten Commandments, God wrote by his finger on tablets of stone. Others were just entirely original from the author themselves. Now, the book of Psalms is different from almost every other book because it does not have one or even two or three authors. It has many authors. Now, we know that's true of the book of Proverbs. We know that Solomon wrote uh, some of the, or most of the Proverbs, but we're told later on that Lemuel is probably one of the authors. Also, Hezekiah's men collected some other Proverbs, not by Solomon. And so probably there's a few authors in the book of Proverbs. And then also books like Samuel, Kings, and Chronicles almost certainly had multiple authors, at least in part. But the book of Psalms is entirely a collection. The whole thing is a collection of writings. There's not one or two or three authors. Every one of the Psalms has unique authors, or I should not say unique. They have uh, individual authors. So David is our largest author. He wrote somewhere around 70 or so of the Psalms. And The other 80 Psalms have multiple different authors. There's no one single author. So part of the history of the book of Psalms is that it was not one guy who sat down and said, hey, you know what I want to do? I want to write some Psalms. Sounds like a good idea. It was not one person who decided, you know what would be really helpful for the the people of God is to have praise songs. He didn't do that. But multiple people, as many as a dozen and possibly more because of how many anonymous ones there are, at least a dozen or so people sat down at different times and recorded these psalms. So part of the history of psalms first is that the psalms are a collection. They're a collection from many different authors and no single author claims final authority for the collection. You can't say who wrote the book of Proverbs or the book of Psalms. Those are unique. You might discuss who wrote the book of Samuels or Kings or Chronicles, but you can't say that about Psalms. We're talking about each one of them individually. Now, as in a collection, there's two elements that are significant. First, the number of Psalms increased over time. Turn to Psalm 72, and this illustrates it. Well, Psalm 72, when you think of a book like Philippians, there was a period of time where there was no book of Philippians. And then one day, Paul decided to write it. And after that, it was considered part of the scripture. Very different situation for the book of Psalms, where one day there was no psalm, and then there was a psalm, and then maybe there was two, and then three, and eventually 150. It took a long time. The number increased over time. Look first at verse 1, Psalm 72, verse 1, of or by Solomon. So who wrote this psalm? Solomon, and I'm going to talk more about that in a a bit, but Solomon wrote this psalm, but then look down at verse uh, 19 and 20, the end of 20, amen and amen, the end of verse 19 there, amen and amen, and then verse 20, whoa, the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. That's kind of strange. You ever noticed that one before? 
Very, very interesting. Verse 20 tells us that the prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. Now, you might think, oh, well, that was just this one psalm. Well, no, that's why we read verse 1. This was written by Solomon. One of the only psalms in the first two books that's written by someone other than David. Coincidence? That the last one is written by someone else? I don't think so. This shows us that the psalms are being added to over time. When David died, Solomon probably either finished or began collecting the psalms of his father and put them into these books. Now, I don't know if David had already done that and Solomon finalized it or if Solomon's the one who did it. But when he did it, he added on verse 20. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. So that the first two books, having been written almost entirely by David, now we're moving on to something else. We'll look at the next verse, 73.1, a psalm of Asaph. Whoa, who's Asaph? Well, that's a whole different discussion. But up until this point, who's the only one writing practically? David, 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 David. And now Solomon helpfully puts on a final one, the last chapter, if you will, of the book, and then... He tells us, okay, now we're moving on to some other psalms that aren't by David. So over time, the psalms were added to. They grew in number over time. At the beginning of David's life, there were very few psalms. In fact, as you read Samuel and you read the history of David's life, probably David had no no psalms in the scripture except maybe a few Five, ten at the most. That's it. That was all in his Psalter was five, maybe maybe as few as one psalm. Not a very big book of psalms. And yet by the end of his life, there were a solid 70 psalms, if not 80 or more, all after David's life. But at the end of David's life, there were another 70 yet to be written. So this is a book that's written gradually over time, over time. Now, I said that the Psalms are a collection. And number two, that therefore, by their very nature, a collection requires a collector. You don't have a collection until someone collects. So the fact that the Psalms are a collection requires that someone had to collect these Psalms. We don't know who that collector is, and there may have been multiple collectors at different point, parts, uh, points in time. I think Solomon, right here where we see Solomon probably had some sort of collecting going on. He collected some of the Psalms. But there are a few implications for this. If the Psalms were collected... If someone gathered these together and added to them, we have multiple implications. I'm just going to point out two. So their nature requires a collector. That's point two. And then A, the sequence of the Psalms matters. The sequence of the Psalms matters. Whoever collected the Psalms put them in a particular sequence. They put them in a particular order. Okay? Now, to illustrate this, Just real quickly, look at Psalm 41. Psalm 41 finishes what we would call book one. I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but look at the last verse, which probably sounds familiar to you. Amen and amen. And then what do you see? Book two. Book two, this is the ending of the psalm. Now, I don't think anyone, uh, I don't think this in, in, the, in the scripture, if you will, book two existed. Book two is, is something outside of the scripture. At some point later on, someone divided the book of Psalms into five books. Now, the amen and the amen is the reason they put it there. Then look at Psalm 72. We were just there. Look at that last one again. 72, 19. Amen and amen. The prayers of David, the son of Jesse, are ended. And then what's the next thing that you have in your text? Book three. Book three. 
So we have a first book, we have a second book, we have a third book, same thing for the fourth book and the, the fifth book. They all have an ending final psalm. The sequence matters. The order matters. Even as Pastor Jeremy's been preaching through, there have been a number of times where he said, hey, look, the psalm right before this had something to do with this psalm. They're, they're thematically connected. So the sequence matters. And then second, the grouping of the psalms matters. Not only does the sequence matter, but the groupings or the grouping of the psalms matters. Look at Psalm 146. Very interesting to note the consistency in these Psalms. Not coincidence, it's not random, very intentional. If, if you, the just simple illustration, if you were to walk across uh, down to the, the beach somewhere, you're on vacation, you go down to the beach, and in the sand you see this letter, H, and then I, and then an exclamation mark. Would any of you think, whoa, the waves left a pattern for me? <laughs> no, nobody would think that. We would all right away know Somebody wrote that because it's not random. That doesn't happen randomly. If you just saw a bunch of dust blowing in the wind, pebbles blown along the sidewalk, you might think that's just random. Nobody did that. But when you see order and structure, what does that tell you? Design. Somebody was there behind it. Okay, so that's what we see in Psalm 146, 7. 8, 9, and 150. So 146, look how it starts. Uh, Just so you know, have something to compare it to. Look at Psalm 145, 1. I will exalt you or extol you, my God and King. And then go down to verse 21, 145, 21. My mouth will speak the praise of the Lord and let all flesh bless his holy name forever and ever. So that's the psalm right before it. Now watch what happens in 146. Verse 1. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord, O my soul. And then look at the last verse in 146. 146.10. The Lord will reign forever, your God, O Zion, to all generations. Praise the Lord. How did he start? Praise the Lord. How did he end? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And then 147. 147.1, how does it start? Praise the Lord. So just take a guess at what's going to happen at the end of the psalm. You got it. Verse 20, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And then 148.1, praise the Lord. And then it ends. 148.14, praise the Lord. 149, praise the Lord. 149.9, praise the Lord. 150, praise the Lord. 150 verse 6, praise the Lord. You kind of get the idea. Oh, this is a pattern. The grouping of these psalms clearly indicates that you're to consider them together. Now, as you're studying them, you've got to figure out for yourself what's the significance of that. But the point that we're making is they are grouped together. They're grouped together, they're written in order, and they're grouped together, and so consider them together. That's all I want to talk about on that. Now, second uh, point of history in their history is just to consider how long of a period of time it took to write the book of Psalms. Uh, I would estimate that it took over a millennium. It took over a thousand years. Now, the earliest psalm that we have uh, for certain is the psalm of Moses, which is Psalm 90. Moses probably then wrote it around 1400 B.C. Uh, Might have been earlier than that, but, but certainly no later. 1440 really is a better date. 14, or is, is Maddie here? What, what is it? 1441 or 42? 42, 1442, thank you. Sunday night youth group. Okay, 
So 1442, Moses writes it. Then I, I, just, I give you the citation, Psalm 137. In Psalm 137, guess what they're talking about? They're talking about Babylon. Well, Babylon doesn't even really exist like that. In, well, they, I, there's a Babel, but there's no Babylon in 1440. Babylon doesn't even capture or, or defeat Israel until around 600. And we have other Psalms that are most likely, they sure seem like they're after the exile, they come back into the land. So a thousand years of time goes by from the first Psalm to the last Psalm. That's huge. You think vocabulary might change at all, maybe, in there? You think our English vocabulary changes at all over a thousand years? Maybe. Yeah, how about five, huh? Like the vocabulary is crazy. The grammar is changing. It's driving people like me and Dave crazy. Okay, I think. Okay, now, that's the, just that history. Consider that. Keep that in mind as we move on to the next part, okay? Authorship. Authorship. Who wrote these psalms? Turn to Psalm 3 just as an example. You can really pick almost any psalm, but look at Psalm 3. And in the title, verse 1, we have a Psalm of David. A Psalm of David. Now, what do you think that means? A psalm of David, what do you think it means? He wrote it. And that would make sense. Makes sense to me. That's what I think. I think you're right. The problem is a lot of people want to say, no, 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 that's not right. It's very popular to say, we don't really know. It could be something else. It could be a psalm by David. But it could be a psalm for David. Or a psalm about David. Or a psalm belonging to David. And so we have a lot of scholars, Christian scholars, who believe in the Bible. And they want to say, no, we don't really know what they mean. A psalm of David could be understood as for David, to David, about David, or belonging to David. Any of those are possible. Now, here's how they would argue it. Go down to verse 1 of chapter 4, and you see, to the choir master. Now, in the Hebrew, the construction, a psalm of David, you could woodenly translate a psalm to David. The preposition that they use is to. So, a psalm to David. In verse 1 of chapter 4, to the choir master, that's the same construction. To the choir master. So you have to David, to the choir master. So they say, how do you take one as written by David and not written by the choir master? Hmm? How do you know? It could, theoretically, mean dedicated to David. Dedicated to the choir master. Those are both possible. Or another example, number two, as in belonging to the sons of Korah. I think we've, we've studied a psalm or two from the sons of Korah. The sons of Korah are a group. Are you telling me that a psalm of the sons of Korah means a psalm written by the sons of Korah? What do they do? Take turns? Like you write the first word, I'll write the second. And did they gather all the sons of Korah together and say, hey, which line do you want? Here, you take a stanza, I'll take a stanza. And they divided it all out and they all took a turn doing it. So some have argued maybe that doesn't mean a psalm by the sons of Korah, but a psalm belonging to the sons of Korah. Maybe, maybe not. I don't think so. So B, others who understand of David to mean by David. This is B under authorship. I think almost all of you already thought that. Uh, just to, to show you, here's, here's a quote from one of, the, one of the more scholarly commentaries, Christian commentaries on the authorship of the Psalms. Here's how he, after arguing all of this, here's his conclusion. 
It may be safest to recognize that the majority of Psalms are anonymous and that no certain statement can be made concerning their authorship. You have no idea. You know who wrote them. No idea. That's not helpful. Let's look then at why others will understand it to mean by David. Okay? Now, this is important because I want you to learn how to interpret Scripture by the Scripture. I don't want you to answer the scholar by finding another scholar who agrees with your point of view. If you have a scholar saying that the of David doesn't mean by David, and you go out and find your own scholar who says, no, it really is, who's the authority? Well, you're fighting a scholar with a scholar. Who's in charge? The scholars are. That's backwards. How do we answer a scholar? We answer him with God's word. We answer him with the authority of the scripture. So if we're able to show the smart guy who knows way more Akkadian than you do, and you're never going to be able to compete with him in Aramaic, how are you going to answer that guy? Not by being better than him in ancient Near Eastern languages. You're going to answer him by showing, you know what? The scripture answers the question. So I want to answer the question of authorship, not by giving you more Hebrew grammar or something like that. It's there. It's there, but that's not the final answer. The answer is by reading the scripture. So turn to Isaiah 38. Isaiah 38. Let's look at examples of this same pattern. A psalm to David. What is that? Or a psalm of David. What does that of mean? And Isaiah 38, we have an example. Again, probably something you've read you may not have noticed. Psalm 1, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 38. And we'll, we'll look at verse 9, but the brief background is Hezekiah, King Hezekiah gets sick. And he says to the prophet Isaiah, am I going to get better? And God tells Isaiah, go and tell him he's not going to get better. Get his house in order. He's going to die. And so Isaiah does that. Hezekiah weeps and he pleads with the Lord. And so the Lord says, okay, I'll give you some more time. An amazing account. It's a wonderful account. But in verse 9, after that happens, this is what we read. A writing to Hezekiah. The same construction. A psalm to David, a writing to Hezekiah, king of Judah, after he had been sick and had recovered from his sickness. I said in the middle of my days, I must depart. I am consigned to the gates of Sheol for the rest of my years. Now, you can read the rest on your own. Who, who's writing this psalm? I He's talking about how the Lord delivered him from a sickness and he thought he was going to die. Who's writing? Hezekiah's writing this. How does Hezekiah indicate that he's writing this? (laughs) He indicates it by saying a writing to Hezekiah or a writing of Hezekiah. Is this a writing about Hezekiah? Well, sure, in some abstract sense it is. Just like any book that any author writes is about themselves to some extent. But what does he mean by a writing of Hezekiah? A writing by Hezekiah. Hezekiah wrote this psalm or writing. It's a, I say psalm because it's, po- it's in poetry form. Okay, now uh, let's look at another one. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel. In verse, or chapter 22. 2 Samuel 22, and do do me a favor, when you get there, put your finger in 2 Samuel 22, 2 Samuel 22, and then Psalm 18. So keep keep your finger in 2 Samuel 22 and also get Psalm 18. All right. 2 Samuel 22. 
verse 1. And David spoke to the Lord the words of this song on the day when the Lord delivered him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. Okay? So that's part of a narrative, real easy to understand. David, the guy we've been speaking about for many chapters in 2 Samuel, that David, David spoke to the Lord the words of this song. Who spoke the words of this psalm? David did. Okay? Now, what does he say? The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock, and whom I take refuge. And he goes on for the whole chapter. Okay? Got that in your mind? Now, keep it there. Keep your finger there and then turn to Psalm 18. Psalm 18, in the title, this is what we read. A Psalm of David, the servant of the Lord, who addressed the words of this song to the Lord on the day when the Lord rescued him from the hand of all his enemies and from the hand of Saul. He said, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. Does that sound familiar at all? Yeah, the, psalm, the words of psalm, uh, 2 Samuel 22 and Psalm 18 are almost identical. It's the same psalm. You read through it, it's, it's not every single word, but virtually the same psalm. In 2 Samuel 22, what are we told in the narrative? Who sang these words? Who spoke these words? David. And then in the psalm, what do we find in the title? We don't, we don't have the narrative because it's not a narrative. It's a poem. But what do we have? A psalm to David. A psalm of David. What do you think of means? It means by. It means David wrote this or spoke this if you want. But it's David's psalm. He's the author of the psalm. All right, there's many other examples. Just one, if you look at Romans 4, don't turn there. David, I'm sorry, Paul argues that Abraham and David are examples of salvation by faith. And he says that they did not get saved by works. And he explains Abraham, and then he says, just as David says, and then he quotes Psalm 32. And guess what you find in Psalm 32 in the title? A psalm by David. What is Paul working from? What assumption is he working from? David wrote that psalm. So do we know who the authors are? Well, some of them are anonymous. But where they indicate a psalm, a prayer, a hymn by David, of David, it means David wrote it. It means Hezekiah wrote it. It means Asaph wrote it. It means whoever wrote it. All right, now. Let's move on from there. Number three. That's the authorship. Now, how about the titles? The titles. The titles of the Psalms are inspired. That is your first point. Go back to Psalm 3. The Psalms titles are inspired. Our English translations are not very helpful in this regard. And it's not the translation, it's the formatting of the translation. So we're at Psalm 3. If you don't have the ESV, you're going to get something similar to this. Don't get confused. You'll get the idea. In the ESV, I see, first thing, save me, oh my God. You all see that? Or most, most of you see that? Or something like that if you don't have the ESV. Save me, oh my God. Guess what? That's not part of the Bible. That's not part of the scriptures. Okay? Now, I think most of you know that. Maybe some of you didn't know that. That's not inspired. That's not part of the book of Psalms. That's added in by the translators or the editor of the ESV. And then uh, on the side, you have a huge, huge number three. Do you all have that? B big old number three. 
So when you just glance at this, what does it look like is the most important thing? Looks kind of like the number three is really important. And then the next most important thing is probably save me, oh my God, whatever that is. That's really important. And then probably the least important thing is a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom, his son. Why do I say probably the least important? Because its font size is the smallest. They shrink it. And not only that, what verse is that in? You just tell me. What verse could I find a Psalm of David when he fled from Absalom in? What is that? Right? The next, the next, the next uh, word or letter or number after Absalom, his son, is verse 1. What do I do with that? I'm in verse 1, so what do I say about a Psalm of David? It's like it doesn't exist. It's in the Netherlands. That's not what I meant. It's, it's, it's nowhere. It's in limbo. It's just hanging out there. It's not very helpful that in our translations, and it's not their fault, they're, I think they're just universally they have the same problem, because way back when the first guy put the numbers in, he, he did this. It's his fault. And we now stick to it, because otherwise, what am I going to say? If I tell you to turn to verse 2 or whatever, and it's your verse 3, oh man, there's confusion all over the place. But guess what? In the Hebrew texts, all of them, have the title as verse 1. All of them do. All the Hebrew texts have verse 1, a psalm of David when he fled from Absalom his son. Verse 2, O Lord, how many are my foes? What does that tell you about the Hebrews? They seem, or the Jews, I guess would be better. They seem to think these titles were important. They seem to include them in the text of the scripture. So we don't have a very helpful translation to deal or formatting of the translation to deal with. But beyond that, many of our popular commentaries and even Christian teachers are scared to say that these are inspired. Uh, here's, Here's a quote from the MacArthur Study Bible. When the titles are surveyed individually and studied as a general phenomenon... There are significant indications that they were appended to their respective psalms shortly after composition and that they contain reliable information. That's called being damned by faint praise. Calling the scriptures reliable means not inspired. That's exactly what he's saying. He's saying this is not inspired. There might be mistakes in them, but they're still reliable. What is he saying about them? They aren't part of the original text. They were appended later on. Now, that's typical. I don't mean to throw him under the bus. I, in fact, I'm almost, I bet you $10 he didn't write that. Someone else did, but that's a different story. <laughs> When you, when you pick up a commentary, it's common to say these aren't part of the scripture. Why? What reason? And there are no reasons. It's, that's kind of been the tradition of them. And I think there are explanations for that, but there are no good reasons. Okay, so why do I think that they're inspired? First, they're included in all of our best manuscripts. All of them are. There, there aren't any Hebrew manuscripts that just leave out the psalm titles. That's pretty important, I think. Number two, they're referenced in the New Testament. Now, I, I already told you about Romans 4. Paul assumes David wrote the psalm. The psalm title tells him it wrote the, he wrote the psalm. But you can see the same thing in Acts 2. You can see the same thing in Acts 13. Not only that, but but we're told which psalm it is. The second psalm. 
So there is a dependence on, a reliance on the information given to us in the psalm titles. Now, I think that part of the reason that we're quick to say dismiss the psalm titles is because of the formatting. You look at verse 3, it's like, eh, who cares? It's not in verse, or chapter, uh, Psalm 3. It's not in verse 1. It's not in verse 12. It's just in there somewhere, in limbo. It's nowhere. But I want to do a little experiment with you. Turn over to Numbers chapter 24. And I want you to tell me if this title is inspired. You think this title is inspired? Uh, I do. And I think it's undeniable. Numbers, uh, I want 24, verse 3. Numbers 24, verse 3. We can start the narrative in verse 2. And Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel camping tribe by tribe. And the spirit of God came upon him and he took up his discourse and said, don't read further, pause there. Don't peek. <laughs> Who, whose discourse is this? Balaam lifted up his eyes and saw Israel and he took up his discourse and said, who's saying Balaam? Balaam's the one saying, here's what Balaam says. This is what Balaam says. The oracle of Balaam. Balaam said that. (laughs) That's huge. Who wrote an oracle or the oracle of Balaam, the son of Beor? Who said that? Balaam said that. So when I get to the book of Psalms and I see a Psalm of David, what do I think? I think David wrote that just like Balaam did. Just like Balaam did. If, if, if that doesn't convince you, just for fun, because we were there. 2 Samuel 23, the next chapter we were in 2 Samuel 22. Go back to 2 Samuel 23 or just listen. 2 Samuel 23 is almost a quotation. It's not, but it's almost a quotation of Numbers 24. So 2 Samuel 23 says this. Now, these are the last words of David. All right, what are they? What did David say? What are his last words? The oracle of David, the son of Jesse. Oh, what's he? I mean, that is like he copied Balaam. What did David say? He said, the oracle of David. When you pick up a book and it says, by so-and-so, do you assume that they didn't write by so-and-so? Maybe. We have a complicated publishing industry. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. Maybe that's not even their name. We do stuff like that today. It's weird. But if you found a letter in a box from your grandmother, and at the bottom of the letter it said, from your true love in its grandpa's name. Is there any doubt who wrote that? Grandpa wrote that. He's the one who wrote that at the end. Just because it's his name doesn't mean that he didn't write it. And who wrote the oracle of David, the son of Jesse? David wrote it. David wrote that. So we should not consider it an appendage, something added on later. And we should not consider it merely reliable. We should consider it inspired. They're referenced in the the New Testament. They're not unique in the Psalms. They're actually all over the Bible. Almost every minor prophet, I think it's 10 out of the 12, something around there. Every one of them has its own title. The, the, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amaz. They all, they almost all give a title. Did they write the title or did someone come along later? And, oh, you know what? We don't really need this uh, vision of Isaiah part. Let's just take that out. I don't think so. Isaiah wrote that title just like David wrote this title here. All right, now. 
go back, uh, go over to Habakkuk three, and I think we'll, I think we'll probably stop here uh, <clears throat> for today. We'll come back. I got two weeks. That's a really dangerous thing to do. Give me two weeks and. <laughs> Okay, Habakkuk chapter 3, and we'll, we'll look again uh, next week at this. But Habakkuk chapter 3, and I want you, these aren't unique to the Psalms, these titles. They're inspired, they're part of the text of Scripture. And look at, uh, first start in Habakkuk chapter 1, because I just told you about it. Verse 1, how does it begin? Habakkuk 1.1. 1, 1. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. And what verse is that, by the way? That is verse 1, because the next one's verse 2. See, they got it right on that one. The oracle that Habakkuk the prophet saw. Okay? So who's, who's writing this book? Habakkuk is writing this book, and you can, you can tell that as he talks. He's even using first person, I will, etc. Then go down to chapter 3. And this is most remarkable. Habakkuk chapter 3, a prayer of Habakkuk the prophet, according to Shigioneth. That sounds vaguely familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, it sounds just like a psalm title. Just like a psalm title. The reason is this is a psalm, or in the format of the psalm. A prayer of Habakkuk the prophet. A prayer of to Habakkuk, literally, to Habakkuk. Who do you think wrote this? There's no question in the context of this book that Habakkuk wrote this. How does Habakkuk indicate that he wrote it? A prayer to Habakkuk. That's how you would do it. This is a prayer of or by Habakkuk. And then, just for fun, as a teaser for next week, look at verse 19. God the Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the deer's. He makes me tread on my high places. Does that sound familiar? You remember, maybe memorized that or heard that as a kid or something. And this part's left out. To the choir master with stringed instruments. What does that sound like? That sounds just like the psalm titles. Something's a little different. I have to come back next week to find out what. <laughs> All right, number four, just so you have your blank, they are not unique to the scriptures. They are not, Psalm titles are not unique to the scriptures. They are not unique to the scriptures. They're, they are all over the ancient Near East, all at that time, around that same region of the world, everyone's using psalm titles. My favorite, Hardy's, you, you would enjoy this. My favorite is a, is a Hurrian song tablet, and it has a colophon that is a title at the end, an ending title, and at the end it says, this, this is in Nib Talib or something like this. This it's a uh, Hurrian. I don't know Hurrian. It's a tune, and for years they couldn't make sense of the tablet at all. 1950 they found it. 1972, finally, someone takes that part seriously. And Draft Corn Kilmer, some ancient Near Eastern scholar, and she she says, "You know what? I think I've got an idea," and she starts piecing things together. And the whole tablet, and it's a literal tablet. It has nothing to do with iPads. It's a, it's a stone tablet, or clay, actually. The whole thing is how to tune an instrument. This is, you start with this sound, and then you turn this way. And as she followed the instructions, guess what you were tuning? This is from 1800 BC. It tuned to the major scale, our modern major scale. That we thought was modern was a tab. We have a tablet from 1800. Anyway, title on that tablet and a colophon on that tablet telling you what it's about, just like we find in the Psalms. It's not unique to the scripture. It's not unique to the Psalms and it's not unique to the scripture. Okay, I want to end 
Uh, I told you I was going to end with that. That's the last passage we'll look at. I just want to give you a couple of thoughts more on, a, on a, an application level, kind of an academic lesson this morning. A couple of things to consider. And this is why I started with Second Timothy. We're looking at all of these psalm titles and all this information about the psalms. It's all nice. Why does it all matter? Why? Why do we care so much about these little words? Why do we care whether or not it's capitalized or not, or, or, or if it's in this size font or that size font? The reason that it matters is because God gave it to us. All scripture is God breathed. All of it. Not just the parts we like. Not just the parts that make us feel nice. So it's easy for us to read portions of the gospel of John and we kind of get excited and giddy. And and what are you going to do with 1 Chronicles 1 through 8? I mean, it's all just genealogy after genealogy. It's just a lit of names. And what are you going to do with Leviticus? Does God know what he's doing? Or should we ignore that part of the Bible? We should not ignore any part of the Bible. God knows what he's doing. And part of that is that he has given us psalms in a particular order and with titles that give us information that help us understand who wrote it, why it was written, so that we can get the context and understand it properly. So do not overlook the importance of that or any other area of the scripture. All of it is inspired by God. All of it is. All right, let me close our time is up. We'll close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you that not a jot or a tittle will pass away from your book, from your law. And we thank you for these psalms that we have been studying that sing both praise of celebration and excitement and mourn great loss. They are psalms for every season and every time. None of them is trite or ignorant of reality. None is written as if the the Christian life or the life of a believer is one of ease and pure comfort, but they are written in real time and real space. We praise you for their encouragement, and we praise you for the clarity that is brought to them as we understand who wrote them and under what circumstances they were written. We pray that you would help us to understand them better, that we might apply them, obey them, follow them, and be encouraged by them. We pray all of this in Christ's name. Amen.